Well, good morning, and thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, on behalf of the UCSF Spine Center, I'm Sig Bourbon, and uh, I'm going to host our meeting today on enhanced recovery after spine surgery. This is such an important topic for us, especially in the uh, age of alternative payment models, where we've got uh, circumstances where we share risk in terms of the cost of care over an episode of care, or certainly under accountable care organization models, we, we uh, share cost over the course of a full year for a population of patients. In this setting, it's so important to really optimize patients across the continuum of care. And really that's what ERAS is about, uh, early recovery after spine surgery. It begins uh, in the preoperative phase of care with preoperative optimization, with really working on modifiable risk factors before surgery. Uh, and trying to optimize those factors that factors of a prolonged length of stay or of a admission. Intraoperatively standardizing care, and of course, postoperatively, uh, early mobilization, early recover, recovery, and trying to um, uh, avoid perioperative complications, uh, prolonged length of stay, and readmission. So to that end, uh, Ian McNeil is uh, one of our top fellows here at UCSF this year. He put together four papers that are gonna be presented over the next hour uh, by other fellows, including Joe Mendelis and Rahul Santami. Ian will do the first paper, and uh, specifically, uh, Ian McNeil is a, uh, a top fellow who's graduated from the uh, Mount Sinai uh, Neurosurgery Program. He joined us this year uh, for the 2020 to 21 fellowship and Ian next year is going to be taking a position in the uh, New York or Connecticut area uh, as an academic spine surgeon. And Ian's going to talk about uh, early recovery after spine surgery, and he'll present the first article. So take over, Ian. Right. Thank you, Dr. Bourbon, for the introduction. And thank, thank you, Seattle Spine Foundation, for this opportunity to talk about this important topic. Um, so let's see, I'll uh, start off just by giving some background about ERAS, and then dive into the first paper. Uh, let's see, just trying to move forward here. Okay, so in terms of the background of ERAS, ERAS is really born out of the general surgery literature, the concept of fast track su surgery, um, fostered by a general surgeon named Henrik Kellett, who was a Denmark general surgeon, and this topic um, came out in the uh, 1990s, and it started by asking a question, why is the hospital, why is the patient in the hospital today? And as a recently graduated resident, I'm kind of close to this topic. I remember rounding and uh, over the years, I can think of probably a hundred reasons why on the day of discharge, the patient couldn't go home. And I think 99, 99 of those are probably preventable. Um, and so it really spans the reasons, really span the continuum of the patient encounter. Um, is it because we didn't set the patient's expectations? You know, they thought they're going to stay for five days and now they're ready to go home on three days. Do they not have proper supports in New York City? Do they have a, a five, uh, five floor walk up and they're not, they're not planning, there's no plan to get them up to their apartment? Are they still on IV meds? Do they have an ileus? Um, the, the list can go on and on. And so um, a, a study group developed around uh, thinking about how we can eliminate the discrepancy between variable traditional practices versus what is actually supported in the literature. And due to the successes within um, colonic surgery, the concept of virus has really expanded um, to uh, a wide range of specialties to cardiovascular surgery, hip and knee surgery, ENT, um, and now there's lots of thought about how we can adopt this to um, spine as well. And so now there's actual full society called the ERAS Society that um, if you visit, you can either go to the link or follow them on Twitter. There's a, a um, a full society that expanded worldwide that thinks about how to establish guidelines and implement. And implement and implementation really is the challenge because as we know, hospitals can be slow to change. Um, and there's, and this implementation really requires multidisciplinary efforts. Um, so I'm gonna dive into our first paper, uh, which is which was published by the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and this is a paper that spans both a literature review of the different components of ERAS and spine, but also has some data around the pilot experience. Um, this is published in uh, the, the Neurosurgery Focus Journal. And so the Cleveland Clinic designed a comprehensive protocol um, that involved many different disciplines, including uh, the Center for Spine Health, anesthesiology, 
blood management, bariatric surgery, and, and endocrinology to improve patient outcomes, reduce late to stay, reduce opioid usage, um, and decrease the need for blood transfusions. Um, and so here you can see a graphic that just kind of displays uh, the idea that, you know, it's a systematic review of preoperative um, factors, intraoperative factors, as well as postoperative factors, and then designing systematic protocols that are hardwired in the patient's care to optimize outcome. Uh, so as I said, this was a literature review, and then uh, they did some evaluation of their ERAS program in adult patients undergoing spine surgery on surgical, surgical site infection rates and blood transfusion rates. So with respect to the infection prevention, uh, this is just a, a retrospective single center cohort study and about evaluated surgical site infection data uh, from March 2012 to the 7th, 2013. And they divided their cohorts into pre and post intervention cohorts and looked at the incident, instance of SSI. Um, and then with respect to blood management, also a retrospective study evaluating blood transfusion rates uh, among three experienced surgeons in patients undergoing thoracolumbar spine surgery, again, looking at pre and post intervention. Here's, um, in terms of our methods, a, a nice graphic just looking at how they classified spine, spine surgery uh, along um, the spectrum of less complex to more complex, looking at uh, the type of surgery, the number of levels, and the expected blood loss. And then um, one of the, th the concepts they highlight in their, pa in their paper is really using decision trees that impact, um, that based on certain patient factors, that would hardwire linkages to other departments. So for instance, if a patient um, had uncontrolled diabetes, they were immediately referred to um, endocrinology and they would defer their surgery for uh, a certain number of weeks to allow the patient to uh, get their, their diabetes under control or improve, them, uh, improve their uh, hemoglobin A1C. If they were anemic, patients were started on iron, EPO, and in some cases referred to hematology. If the patients had elevated BMI, a certain uh, greater than 40, they were actually recommended to see bariatric surgery. And uh, elderly patients were automatically referred to geriatrics and had their surgery deferred, deferred for six weeks, optimized um, pre-op planning and prehab. Um, their infection prevention bundle was actually published in, a, in JAMA surgery in October 2016. They had a nine um, uh, a nine point infection prevention bundle, which they, which reduced their infections by 50%. Um, and they saw uh, more than $800 per capita in terms of reducing the cost of surgical, uh, surgical episodes. Um, in terms of blood management, they utilized uh, TXA, a restrictive transfusion policy, a cell saver, and then really use fluids to, uh, as a goal directed therapy to manage um, various very variations in um, stroke volume and pulse pressure. And also they had a post-operative recovery mobiliz mobilization program where patients were mobilized within eight hours on the day of surgery, foliage removed post-op day one, and there was a standardized uh, chemical uh, DVT prophylaxis, uh, non-chemical and chemical DVT prophylaxis. Um, so in terms of results over in the pr infection prevention bundle, uh, they looked at overall 1,700 patients, uh, 971 pre-intervention, 7, 799 post-op. Um, the rate of surgical site infections uh, was 4 point, about 4% in the pre-intervention cohort, 2% in the post-intervention cohort. Um, and they found these differences to be statistically significant. And you can see that mapped out here on this graphic, a pretty significant drop. Um, and then in terms of blood management, um, the pre-intervention rates were 20, was 20% 20 and the post-intervention rates were um, 7%. And they documented no change in morbidity or mortality rates with this restrictive transfusion protocol. I'll get into some of the limitations with this data, but overall uh, what this paper does a good job of is if you, you look at it uh, in terms of their uh, description of all their decisions and what they incorporated, they, they do a good job of highlighting all the literature to support the different factors. And so this paper is a good um, review for um, those that want to learn more about the different um, factors and the literature to support the, these changes. Um, and the infection prevention bundle uh, may yield dur durable significant reductions in infection rates as well as cost savings. And their preliminary data suggests that we can 
uh, treat patients well and, and limit the amount of blood we're transfusing peri-op peri and post-op. Uh, in terms of limitations, of course, this is a retrospective review. It's a small cohort, particularly in the blood management. They don't report their baseline characteristics of a cohort, so this limits the generalizability of the paper. Um, and for instance, they don't they just de they describe no change morbidity, but they don't uh, describe what they were measuring in terms of um, morbidity outcomes. Um, and then I think the other interesting thing, if you think about actually implementation, anybody who's worked in a hospital know that you can't just design a graphic or put together a policy and expect processes to change. And so the reality is that it's the implementation occurred in phases. And so it's not really, you can't really draw a hard line to say in Q1, we had one practice and Q2, we had a different practice. There's a lot of effort um, meetings and monitoring required for compliance. So the reality is we may never have a clear um, hard line pre and post cohort that um, gives us cl perfectly clean data. But I think we can rest assured that there's literature to support these decisions and that in these programs is doing the best thing for the patient. Um, so in conclusions, there are key risk factors and practice that, practices that correlate with ORC outcomes that can be redress, re reduced by systematic review of the literature and implementation of a systematic and iterative program uh, with implementation and monitoring within a multidisciplinary approach to ultimately, ultimately impact outcomes for patients for the better. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, Dr. Bourbon, do you have any additional comments or in, take in, in terrific overview of a, this is one of the larger series in the literature that uh, we'll be re reviewing today, over 1700 patients reviewed. And as you indicated, in an implement, in a um, EROS protocol that's been implemented over time, uh, if there is anybody from the clinic, the Cleveland Clinic uh, on the line, I, I know that we've uh, had some Cleveland Clinic participants in the past, so certainly uh, do feel free to speak up about the experience. Uh, I've, I've spent some time there uh, as a visitor, and in, indeed, I think uh, they've got a terrifically integrated program uh, that really works well in terms of creating protocols that are adhered to across a group of surgeons. So with regard to what the Cleveland Clinic did is they looked, again, across the continuum, preoperative optimization, identifying patients who are overweight, identifying patients with diabetes, identifying smokers, identifying patients who had uh, uh, blood problems, including anemia before surgery, and to that end, really working on optimizing some of the modifiable risk factors before surgery. And in some instances, actually not bringing high-risk patients to surgery. The major effect size of this paper were twofold. It was reducing infections um, and, and also quite significantly uh, reducing blood transfusion needs. And I thought that the effects uh, were somewhat higher than I might have expected. The infection protocol had been studied separately and published in JAMA. Uh, the use of intraoperative vancomycin was part of the protocol. Obviously, preoperative prepping of patients um, that uh, uh, effect size going from over, uh, um, uh, what was it, four, four and a half percent to a two percent infection rate was, uh, was a big difference. I wonder if anybody else on the line wants to uh, share some of their experience with uh, what are you doing for infection prevention? I think Jen's, Jen's got his hand up. Go ahead, Jens. Yeah, terrific topic. Great presentation, Ian. Thank you so much, uh, UCSF, for bringing this up. So many things to talk about. It's obviously a very important way to kind of just become better doctors, better practitioners, because it really puts everything together. Now, uh, two things, um, Ian, SIG, UCSF. Number one, when there's a program change like what the Cleveland Clinic uh, uh, promoted, I'm always curious about implementation. We have a lot of those same policies. And then when I go around, I don't see the patients mobilized within eight hours. I don't see this or that happening. So what was their program implementation accounting? Number one. Number two, blood transfusions. We just recently had a journal club on that also internally. And again, this is so controversial. We ourselves published in this space, and I think this is a far more complicated subject. And I'm going specifically at major spine surgeries, uh, where if we allow a patient to go into shock um, or shock-like physiologic status, they are far higher risk of infections than not. So um, that subject is still one that fulfills me with a lot of puzzlement especially in the ER EROS uh, thing. And when I reviewed that paper, I was highly kind of doubtful as to their methodology. So number one, so the compound question, sorry, let me stratify. Number one, implementation. How did they account for actual implementation of all these great theories? And number two, blood transfusions and major spine surgery. Thank you. Can you want to take that? Sure. I think um, in the paper, 
they did they acknowledge some of the, the the myriad challenges in implementation and so and actually before going to medical med school i was actually a hospital consultant for five years working on implementation of um you know you know multidisciplinary um hospital-wide um uh change um change engagements and i i think uh, one of the things they decide they acknowledge that this was a phased approach so um one and then as a consultant um, we also had more success with the phased approach. So for instance, they had five different areas, for instance, the, the smoking, um, BMI, and um, uh, diabetes control, all, all these different elements they wanted to tackle. What I, I think that they suggest is that a, a phased approach, so tackling one of those uh, tracks, so perhaps the geriatrics alignment and optimizing that, hardwiring that to make sure that when the patient is seen in pre-op, that referrals hardwired to geriatrics, and then you have the opportunity to take a, a few weeks or months to evaluate the successes, collect data, and then make changes. And once that is um, working, then you roll that out to the next um, multiple disciplinary effort. So maybe the partnership with endocrinology and diabetes management. I think that in a hospital, it's too complex to implement this all five elements at once. Um, and then there's continual need for monitoring, discussion, um, which also can be a challenge given that everyone kind of operates in their same different silos. So they do acknowledge that this, the implementation is really the challenge. And if you actually look at the ERAS literature um, in general surgery, the data has been slow to come up, come out over two decades because of the challenges with implementation. Um, so it really is taking an idea and putting it in practice. That's the, the issue. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of inertia in our perioperative protocols and um, working on interdisciplinary protocols can be particularly difficult. And the conclusion we're going to come to in one of, the, uh, one of the papers upcoming is that a lot of this does require some hospital level support. But Sig, if I could just make a comment uh, on that. Yeah. Having uh, spent many years at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, one of the things that I realized in implementing these efforts is that this is not a spectator sport. As the surgeon, we are ultimately responsible for that patient. So every step of the way of ERAS, of this enhanced recovery protocol, is really our responsibility. And we're the conductors or the, the quarterbacks. We have to coach every single step of that to make sure that it's done. If you sit back and assume it's going to be done, it doesn't get done. So that's one of the things that I encourage everybody to get really involved with it and, and have a protocol going and watch it go step by step, but interact as you need to, to make sure that the patient gets all those points. Yeah, great point, Izzy. Thanks, thanks for uh, adding that. Let's transition because this seems to come up again. And our, our next paper will be given by uh, Rahul Tommy and, and Dr. Birch will moderate the next session, next paper. All right, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bourbon. Um, so the next paper that we'll talk about uh, here is. Uh, and, and Rahul, I'm sorry. Let me give a brief introduction. Then I'm I'm sorry about that transition. So uh, so Rahul is again one of our uh, top fellows. Rahul came to us from the University of Wisconsin, uh, where he did a lot of work uh, with uh, uh, deformity and um, and also degenerative pathology. He worked with Cliff Tribune and uh, Thomas Deblick and Paul Anderson out there, who have all contributed to our, our forum here with the SSF. And uh, Rahul is going to be uh, taking work in our, our America's heartland next year and uh, has done a terrific job with some, some of our uh, academic initiatives. So this is uh, Rahul's presentation. All right, perfect. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Bourbon. So um, the topic that we'll talk about here uh, is uh, benefits of recovery after surgery for fusion in a degenerative uh, spine surgery and uh, impact, impact of outcome, length of stay, and patient satisfaction. So uh, background, Ian kind of provided the background already for this. This was obviously pioneered um, by uh, Henna Kalat. Um, and for, for our standpoint, uh, the ERS protocol uh, works on optimization of pre-intra and post-operative, um, the post-operative stage uh, of surgery and uh, places the patient in the sun, uh, center uh, of their care. Uh, Implementation in spine is uh, new and kind of growing and evolving slowly. Uh, so this uh, study uh, evaluates 
um, ERS and degenerative fusion procedures. So this was a retrospective analysis of prospectively gathered data from a single institutional registry. Uh, ERS at this hospital uh, had been implemented since 2013 uh, for lumbar disc herniations, ACDFs, decompressions, and spine fusion procedures. Um, what they did is they took their last year pre-ERAS, which was 2012 to 2013, uh, and ERAS had been implemented over a period of time, um, but uh, it was kind of going full force in 2016, 2017, which is when they gathered the data. They took all their consecutive patients for uh, fusion procedures uh, for degenerative conditions, excluding deformity uh, for ALIF, ACDF, um, and posterior, and uh, sorry, PLIFs and uh, T-LIFs. Uh, their technique... Um, was they had the patient uh, come in, meet with the surgeon, meet with the anesthesiologist, meet with physical therapist, kind of address all their concerns, address the stair, uh, stair situation if, if they had that at home. Um, they also had a 24 hour uh, ERAS unit, which was staffed by nursing uh, for direct patient communication. The nurses explained pre and post operative course. Uh, they were again available by phone or through an app uh, for 24 seven uh, concerns or, or answers to any of their questions. Uh, they were also able to pre-register um, for admission. So the morning they came in, they didn't have to, they didn't have to do that. During the hospitalization, they uh, admitted the patients at 7 a.m. So they didn't have to come in as early. Uh, they uh, had them NPO at six hours, but did allow liquids um, up to two hours prior. Um, and the patient walked themselves to the operating room uh, intraoperatively, uh, they discussed that they performed muscle sparing surgical techniques, although specific techniques uh, were not described in this paper. Um, they navigated their posterior lumbar implants. Uh, they did their a list with vascular surgeon access, uh, ACDFs using a microscope, and they limited their use of drains and bracing. Uh, and then two hours uh, in the recovery room, they had a visit from the rehab team to again, discuss any concerns or um, address any of their questions. Uh, Post-operatively, the discharges were expedited. Um, they uh, had a multimodal pain regimen limiting narcotics, mostly NSAIDs and tramadol, uh, occasional oxycodone if they uh, had severe pain. They uh, had patient education regarding uh, analgesia and limiting narcotic usage. Um, they focused on early discharge, and again, with their 24-7 um, ERAS nurse, uh, they uh, communicated with the patients uh, early and often. They uh, had an app, the eFit Back mobile app, that the patients had access to 48 hours preoperatively and up to 15 days postoperatively, post uh, when that app submitted questionnaires to the patients um, regarding their dressing, their pain, their uh, temperature, if they're having a fever, uh, how they were mobilizing. If the patient did not respond or if they had any alarm responses, uh, they were called by the ERAS team. So this is an example here of their app uh, that they showed in the paper and it asked them these questions. Is there bleeding uh, on your Band-Aid? And then they could, answer, um, they could answer these questions. And again, alarm symptoms would prompt uh, the ERAS team to give them a call so uh, it could avoid uh, complications in the future. So this is kind of a graphic visual visualization of um, their protocol. Uh, we talked about all this stuff, but it just uh, lays it out quite nicely. So outcomes patients were seen at uh, six weeks and then afterwards if uh, they needed it, um, and they an analyzed post-operative endpoints, including uh, major and minor complications. Uh, and they defined major complications as uh, requiring treatment or increased length of stay by seven days, long-term uh, sequela lasting six months or death. And minor complications were defined as events requiring no or minimal treatment uh, and increased length of stay um, by two to seven days and no, uh, no sequela lasting greater than six months. Uh, demographics, they actually had a similar cohort um, compared to the uh, pre and post. Uh, one thing I did want to draw, draw your eyes to, um, increased amount of multi-level uh, surgery for the ACDF in the post-ERAS cohort. But another thing that's interesting is that um, BMI for all these patients were averaged to be about 25 to 27. Uh, ASA 
was almost 60% or, or higher than 50% in ASA one. And, and I'm not sure if this is because it, it didn't specify this tobacco use um, was current or if it was previous, but it's almost 50% in this population, which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, so their results, the length of stay actually, you can see decreased significantly for their ALIF, ACDF, or posterior fusion cohort. Uh, all of these were uh, significant. Uh, complications, uh, they note that um, there was a, not a significant increase in their complication rate uh, in major or minor complications. Uh, limitations of this uh, study, obviously it was only degenerative. Um, they don't discuss the healthcare economics or, or their uh, implementation um, cost. Uh, they do talk about uh, getting a lot of stakeholder buy-in, but um, they don't discuss the cost of it too much. Um, they do discuss that the cost was worth it, uh, given the decreased length of stay, um, but they don't go into much more detail. Uh, it is a retrospective uh, study, um, and 20, uh, it, it would be a little difficult to adopt, I, I think, in a lot of centers, having a 24-7 ERS nursing hotline um, might be a little challenging. Also, their, their patient population seemed it seemed a little different than, than some of the population that I've seen in my short time in spine surgery um, with their BMI averaging in 25 and 50% and of them being smokers, either previ previous or, or current. Uh, so their conclusion was after implementation of the ERAS protocol decreased length of stay without an increase in complication, they did demonstrate that they had good patient satisfaction. They didn't have this chart for pre-ERAS, but this is the post-ERAS chart. Um, and they talked about improved patient education um, as the education was provided before uh, and during and even after uh, education. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ravel. That was uh, that was a terrific uh, overview. Um, I, I apologize to everybody. My I have technical difficulties with my camera this morning. Um, this is Shane Birch. So um, yeah, I I uh, thought this paper was a was a pretty good paper. It uh, it um, obviously you know is dealing with the European population, as Rahul mentioned, high smoking population, uh, fairly low BMI. And uh, you know they they quoted the average length of stay for some of these uh, procedures is five to seven days, which would be sort of on the long side here. But I think the the overall uh, message that this paper gave was that um, with uh, you know looking at pre-op, intra-op, and post-op care, you can uh, implement significant changes uh, to things like length of stay. And probably one of the, the most interesting things that was said in the paper was that the, the actual physical stay was shorter, but the continuity of care of the patient was longer. And I think that, um, it, uh, that that's, that's an interesting message. And, and um, you know, it goes back to saying that, um, you know, we really need to take control of our patients uh, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. Um, and um, doing that, we can, uh, you know, evoke evoke changes. A um, couple of cu couple of the things that um, uh, I I uh, am uncertain about in the paper, um, you know, when you're looking at a, a range from 2012, 2013 to 2017, there's a tremendous evolution in techniques, at least um, at least at UCS there there has been in in terms of surgical techniques. And that's played a, a large role in the, the um, change in, in length of stay. So that would also be one of the limitations. They didn't really state that their techniques had, had stayed the same uh, over that five to seven year period. And then, um, um, you know, post-operatively, the use of the e-tools. Um, uh, we uh, at UCSF used the uh, health loop for a while. And um, you know, one of the things that they cited in this paper was that there was a 13% high uh, um, false positive rate uh, from patients um, you know, calling in and saying, hey, there's an infection going on and really um, their infection rate was only two and a half percent. So there, there's a high po uh, false positive rate with uh, the, the use of these e-tools and uh, that certainly would require a, um, a significant uh, um, you know, manpower to, to, uh, um, to use that effectively. 
Um, one of the things that I thought um, they did well, though, is uh, looking at the, the smoking population in the, in the weeding out the, the smokers um, in the patients who had posterior lumbar fusions, and they actually dropped their complication rate just by weeding out smokers. So overall, the paper was pretty good. Um, I think it brings up um, uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion points, but, but overall, I think the, the biggest thing to, to take home here is that the, the more involvement we have with our patients, I think the better that they're going to do. Jens, you, had a, you got a uh, question? Thank you for bringing this paper up and a great discussion. So methodological point from my end, whenever I see a mixture of cervical and thoracal lumbar surgeries in larger kind of epidemiologic uh, structured papers, I'm deeply suspicious because it highly pollutes the outcome. For instance, anterior cervical surgery is just a completely different beast from posterior open thoracal lumbar surgery. So just on a methodological basis, I was going to ask you and uh, your colleagues what they thought about when you see these kind of mixed things, for instance, with infection rates, blood transfusion needs, length of stay, et cetera. Well, I... Th I um... Rahul, you can uh, you, uh, chime in here too, but just to answer that, I, I thought they did a pretty good job at actually uh, separating out the three different procedures. And so I didn't think it was that muddied. Uh, you know, they, they separated out ALIF, ACDF, and, and then TLIF or CLIFs. Um, and I don't think they mixed uh, the results that, that much. Uh, Rahul, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Birch. Um, it sounds like they just completely separated those groups and were just comparing like to like. So ACDS pre and post, uh, ALIFs pre and post, and posterior uh, fusions pre and post. And it didn't seem like they kind of clumped them in, in together at all. So it was totally uh, separated. Let's go ahead and transition because we've got a couple more papers to cover. And again, uh, staying with a similar theme here, um, but Alekos, I'll, I'll let you take over as moderator the next session and Ian's going to present again. Thank you. Um, so I chose uh, this next paper um, entitled Helping Spine Surgeons Detect Pre-Surgical uh, Psychological Stress in Complex Spine Patients uh, and Observation Pilot Study because I think um, uh, when we think about the burden of mental health and how it impacts our patients, uh, I think we all couldn't recognize there's an impact and there is some literature to describe this. Um, but in terms of thinking about how this informs our decision-making pre-op, um, per even peri-op and post-op um, and how it affects our outcomes and how we can be better physicians in taking care of patients who have significant um, psychological comorbidities and psychological stressors, um, I think there's opportunity to do uh, a better systematic um, job and take a systematic look of, uh, of what we can do. So in terms of background, um, uh, so th there are, there's literature to support the idea that unaddressed psychological comorbidities have been found to negatively impact uh, spine surgery outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, we do have uh, several uh, different ways of assessing patients. The SF36, for instance, it does um, have a component that addresses mental health, but um, most spine surgeons uh, in terms of literature and surveys uh, do not use a, a systematic screening device um, that can help us identify patients with a significant comor comorbidity of mental illness. And when we think about adult spinal deformity in particular, 27% uh, uh, have at least one psychiatric diagnosis, um, a quarter have two or more diagnoses. Um, and then adult spinal deformity patients um, have with depression or anxiety, uh, there has been literature support, higher risk of readmission and, and risen surgery. I actually asked Dr. Theologist to part partner on this paper because he was actually um, uh, a first author on a paper that suggested that uh, depression did not necessarily reflect um, uh, higher risk in terms of readmission or re revision, but, uh, but there is literature to support the, the opposite. And so the idea here is that there's a standard screening protocol could help surgeons identify at-risk patients and help them uh, with pre-op counseling and optimization. Uh, so this was uh, done at the Virginia Mason um, Center in, in Seattle. Um, and they, the objective was to evaluate a standardized pre-surgical evaluation program for complex sur spine surgery. So this is a four-year retrospective assessment of their pre-surgical evaluation. The inclusion criteria were adult patients who are undergoing complex spine surgery defined as surgery 
greater than six hours, more than six levels, or if the surgeon decided it was a complex case, they excluded um, malignancy, tumors, or fractures. And the patients all underwent a two-hour clinical evaluation with like psychologists and at least had about six months of follow-up. Th they internally developed this interesting color coding scheme, which uh, basically illustrates the continuum of uh, psychological disorder burden, ranging from a green color, which um, suggests that there's low psychological burden, to red, which suggests high psychological burden with active psychosis or suicidal ideation. And the patients were categorized in two groups, both patients who had an evaluation and those patients had no evaluation. Some of those patients just didn't, um, weren't able to be scheduled. And that kind of highlights again, uh, the, the difficulties with implementing ERAS. Um, some patients declined and so um, that does introduce some, some bias, but they, they did use this to establish their two cohorts. Um, again, the population was defined by the, the complex bind criteria, and then chart abstraction was used to collect uh, the morphine equivalent dosage, surgical invasiveness, uh, their color grades on the psychological scheme we just look, looked at, and then the scores on various psychological instruments. Um, so after, uh, with, with those inclusion criteria, they identified 129 consecutive patients over four years. Um, the evaluated versus non-evaluated patients were demographically similar. Um, there, when we look at the overall uh, color coding grading, there was a, a slight skew to a higher level of psychological board burden. Interestingly, 83% had at least one psychological disorder or psychosocial barrier and 17% had, only 17% had realistic expectations, good support plan, no history of mental illness. Their definition of um, realistic expectations and support plan was um, not necessarily delineated, and this is somewhat subjective, but they did highlight this, this point. Um, so in terms of results, patients with a higher color grade had lower rates of discharge home. However, this is not statistically significant. And then also length of stay trended higher with higher grade of, um, on their psychological evaluation scheme. Um, furthermore, uh, patients who had uh, higher, more, uh, higher grades, so orange or a uh, higher, ha were taking higher um, doses of opioids at their six month follow up. But this again did not reach statistical significance. And so when we think about this, um, there, there's conflicted evidence within the spinal literature, and they highlight this in their um, preamble as well as their discussion. Um, there's conflicting evidence as to the, the impact of mental illness on um, spine surgery, and particularly in adult deformity surgery. Um, I think experientially and empirically, we've all seen how this can impact. You know, if a patient is depressed um, or anxious, it affects how they inter interact with providers, it can affect how they, their motivation to, um, to work with physical therapy and get out of bed uh, post-op. It, it can definitely impact their, um, their experience of pain and discomfort. Um, and so I, I think despite the conflicting literature, I think as surgeons, physicians, we do know that there's a need to you know, carefully look at this. Um, so one factor in the, the, the conflicting evidence is that there are a variety of screening mechanisms um, and batteries of tests, and there's not necessarily uniformity, uniformity when we think about how we screen patients. Um, the literature does suggest that we are likely to underestimate burden, and if you just think about how our clinics and offices are designed, they're definitely not designed to support a, you know, a two-hour um, psychological evaluation, let alone you know, perhaps even a 15-minute discussion around depression, anxiety, and mental health symptoms, and how we can support those psychosocial issues, um, but perhaps we need to think about how we can do that. Um, because at this paper, uh, less than 20% had realistic expectations, um, good support at home. I know coming from New York, you know, the idea of doing major deformity surgery and then sending the patient home to a fifth floor walk up, um, that, that is a significant psychosocial barrier that needs to be supported, supported from the first discussion about surgery. Um, and then obviously there's significant, um, significant burden of depression, anxiety, PTSD, 
And so I think we can evaluate how we set expectations help and help patients develop um, support programs. So in terms of limitations of the study, the color recording system was still somewhat objective. Um, there was no assessment of inner rater and inter intra rater reliability. The significant resources of two hours of psychologist time may limit um, how that can be applied elsewhere and is certainly not likely to be replicable in resource limited set settings. And the study does not account for how spinal pathology may contribute to the baseline mental health status. So it, it can kind of be a, you know, a downward spiral of pain facilitating depression, depression facilitating pain and so on. Um, and then unlike the Cleveland Clinic paper where there were just, just the dif discrete decision trees based on the screening, this, this paper did not discrete, describe how the screening informed pre-op, peri-op, or post-op treatment plans um, and what they implemented around supporting the patients with the, the burden of mental health issues. So in conclusion, um, comprehensive pre-surgical psychological evaluations may be beneficial for risk stratifications, uh, particularly in patients with adult spinal deformity given their burden of mental health um, as we described in the initial um, preamble. Um, and a higher psychological illness or burden was associated with lower likelihood of discharge home, longer length of stay, and higher opiate use at six months follow-up. However, as I noted, these trends did not meet statistical significance. There is further investigation required to determine what is the most reliable form and forum for mental health screening for surgical purposes, and also the impact of mental health risk stratification on long-term outcomes, patient satisfaction, opiate consumption, and functional status. Um, thank you. D uh, Dr. Theologis, do you, you have any thoughts or comments? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Ian. That was an outstanding um, overview of, of, the, of the paper methods, results, and um, the important limitations. And uh, this is an important topic, and I'm glad you chose it as part of this discussion. The um, Mental health, as we all know, is, is uh, very, very common in our society, and it's a, it's a disease that is very, very uh, heterogeneous, and it um, evolves over time, too. Um, uh, and when I say heterogeneous, some of it is very silent, uh, where others, it's very, very apparent. And uh, you touched upon how it's difficult to, A, assess, um, there isn't one routine screening tool. Um, and then two is uh, there's unknown how, um, if, if it's modifiable um, and how, if it is, um, whether that will um, be a sustained modification. So I think that uh, um, really, that that's the reason why A, the surgeon, surgeons in general have difficult time um, screening for it and B, it's difficult to uh, get a hold of it. Um, I think this paper, as you mentioned, um, was robust in terms of its psychological evaluation of the patients. And it, it used, I think, five, uh, five questionnaires, and um, it did a good job of highlighting the psychological burden in this patient population. Um, what it didn't get at, which you had alluded to uh, and clearly stated, was that it didn't, A, what that information, um, how it affected the outcomes of patients was unknown, and then how it um, changed the preoperative course, whether they decide to do surgery or not. Um, so it's somewhat observational. Um, so I think a nice future study from this paper would be to see how these, um, this specific scoring system um, and grading would affect outcomes and then see how the score potentially could be changed in the uh, preoperative setting and whether that would change outcomes. And that really gets to the point of this whole concept of preoperative, preoperative optimization and prehab. Um, at UCSF, we're starting to do that. Um, but I think in order to do that successfully and have it be more generalizable, have to somehow find a subset of the questionnaire or you know, one questionnaire that could be used uh, because clearly a two hour psychological evaluation is not gonna be feasible um, at multiple institutions. And um, as the paper that you had mentioned was in collaboration with the ISSG that I was part of. And it looked at 
um, deformity patients, whether depression was a, um, in, in of itself an independent predictor of poor outcomes. And we found that it was not after we adjusted for um, severity of deformity and surgical invasiveness. Um, we looked at different questionnaires of mental health. So the SRS-22, the mental health component of that. Um, we also looked at the DRAM questionnaire, which is the um, distress and risk assessment method. And, um, and the SF, um, SF-12. And what we found was that the DRAM um, <clears throat> score, especially the patients who had a, um, who were somaticizing, had uh, worse outcomes. So at UCSF, um, I'm not sure if other institutions use a DRAM. We don't use it here, but I think that that's something that I would like to implement in my practice because I do, I do think that it has, uh, it's about 45 questions, which is still a lot, but it's not a two hour evaluation. I think that would be um, a beneficial thing in, in clinical practice. Just, just briefly, know, like here's, I here's, said, the TBI group say, had, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say that Andy Block at TBI, he's been working with us for 30 years and he's uh, basically devoted his career to pre-surgical screening. <laughs> And he's been working with some researchers, I believe, at either University of Wisconsin or Minnesota, where they have a grant. And uh, we used to use the MMPI. Now it has a modified um, questionnaire. And we do that routinely. And it's amazing. Um, and it's all the things that uh, I, I forget which fellow had uh, talked about in the paper. But it's, it's determining expectations, it's determining depression, anxiety. And it makes a tremendous difference because you can tell the patients these are expectations from surgery. They don't listen to us. And also, he gives us a scale at the end and says, this patient is a good risk, or this patient is a fair risk, or this patient is an average risk. And uh, if they are in the poor category, it's like, you know, you don't want to operate on them for any elective surgery. Others that are in the um, average risk, he says, they might need a session or two, and then he can work with them. So I think it's very, very important. And I tell the fellows that half the success of the surgery is not only doing the right job and making the right diagnosis from our standpoint, but then the psychological support. Yeah, re really important point. And thanks for bringing that up. And your experience at TBI, I know has been, been very strong with that. Just through the chat, a couple of comments about uh, history of childhood abuse, uh, history of uh, depression, uh, being, uh, and uh, catastrophizing are really strong risk factors uh, for bad outcomes. Let, let's take our last 12 minutes here and give time for Joe Mendelis. Uh, so Joe, did his residency at Montefiore. Uh, Joe is uh, uh, looking for work down in Los Angeles next uh, year. He'll be a terrific addition to any academic practice down there. And Joe's gonna talk specifically on ERAS protocols on affecting opiate use as well as readmission in deformity surgery. So take it away, Joe. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Bourbon. Um, so I'm going to be discussing this paper, uh, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Reduces Postoperative Opioid Use and 90-Day Readmission Rates After Open Thoracolumbar Fusion for Adult Degenerative Deformity. Uh, this came out of UT Southwestern in Dallas, and it was published in July of this year. So as we've been discussing, URS programs have been consistently shown to reduce costs, complications, and improve outcomes. And it has been studied in spine surgery, obviously, but the authors claim that the data uh, presented previously is more heterogeneous and discusses more short segment procedures. Now, as we all know, thoracolumbar fusion represents a major physical trauma as well as psychologic and physiologic stress for the patient. And the role of EGAS in this patient population hasn't previously been studied. So uh, they sought to determine the impact of an ERAS pathway in adult patients undergoing open thoracolumbar pelvic fusion for degenerative scoliosis. And uh, they looked at postoperative outcomes, postoperative narcotic consumption using morphine equivalent dose, postoperative complications, and unplanned readmissions. And obviously, this is important because with the uh, opioid pandemic, we're all uh, more conscious about opioid use and are trying to limit that. Um, health systems are also pressuring um, uh, care providers to reduce costs. And we all obviously want to perform uh, any modifications to our protocols that can increase our, our patient outcomes or improve our patient outcomes. So this was a retrospective single center study and um, all the procedures were done by the senior author. They looked at 124 consecutive patients before and after the implementation of an ERAS program. They did not exclude any patients for preoperative medical issues or for preoperative opioid use. 
All of the patients underwent thoracolumbar pelvic posterior spinal fusion for degenerative scoliosis, and they all had an open approach with pedicle screws and only posterior column osteotomies, no three column osteotomies. Uh, the ERAS protocol consisted of pre-op, intra-op, and post-op multimodal patient management by several teams across multiple disciplines. So uh, this graphic summarizes their ERAS protocol that they used. Uh, for preoperative care, they uh, did a referral to behavioral health and psychology to set patient expectations preoperatively and to screen for psychiatric diagnoses that may have an effect on outcome. Expectation management included patient education regarding post-op pain and the importance of non-narcotic medications. They were also educated on how to communicate using an electronic health record uh, patient portal. Uh, a preoperative geriatric consultation was performed uh, with the main goal of optimizing pain meds and reducing delirium and demotivation after surgery. Patients were counseled regarding smoking cessation and adequate preoperative nutrition, and they actually had to be nicotine free uh, before six weeks for their planned surgery. A uh, nicotine level was drawn the morning of surgery, and if it was positive, the case was canceled. Uh, patients who were identified as having any nutritional issues by the geriatrician were referred to a dietary clinic and treated preoperatively, um, as were patients with osteoporosis. They were also referred to a mineral metabolism clinic and treated before uh, surgery to optimize bone density. Uh, they also assessed markers of frailty, and uh, a prehab program was assigned on a case-by-case -case basis. So intraoperatively, their ERAS pathway consisted of transexamic acid administration, um, an epidural catheter placement for postoperative pain control, and anesthesia protocols that were tailored uh, to maintain normal tension and avoid severe intraoperative anemia. This included a hemoglobin transfusion, transfusion threshold of 10, uh, transfusion of FFP for every three units of Packard blood cells, and platelets for every five units of Packard blood cells, and administration of cryoprecipitate if a fibrinogen level went below uh, 100 milligrams per deciliter. Postoperatively, all the patients were seen by physical therapy and pain management after surgery, as well as by the geriatrics team. And all patients were expected to sit up in bed on post-op day zero and initiated their walking with physical therapy on day one. DVT prophylaxis was optimized with compression stockings and the initiation of low molecular weight heparin on the first day after surgery. And special attention was given to appropriate nutritional intake, multimodal analgesia, and narcotic medication minimization. So they analyzed 124 patients. There was 57 in the pre-ERS group and 67 in the ERS group, and they didn't have any significant differences in age um, or, or BMI. Both groups did include slightly more females than males. They had a similar number of segments fused. However, there was a trend towards uh, significance for one extra level in the pre-ERS group, 10.6 versus 9.5. The patients all had a similar Cobb angle, similar operative time, similar anesthesia time, and a similar ICU length of stay. There was no statistically significant difference in the daily pain VAS score or in post-op ambulation between groups, indicating that the pain was similar between the two groups. And epidural catheters were used in the um, ERAS group. 46 of the patients received these catheters, while none of them in the pre-ERAS group had epidurals. This table summarizes the results of this study. I have uh, put a green box around all of the statistically significant um, results in their analysis. It's interesting to note that there was a decrease in blood loss, total opioid use, urinary retention, constipation, and 90-day readmission for the ERAS group, but there was an increase in hospital length of stay for the ERAS group by about one day. Um, so in terms of discussion, you know, they had the same ICU length of stay between groups, but this extra day in the hospital overall, um, you know, this could be because of the emphasis on patient preparedness prior to discharge, and um, also this multimodal management, having physical therapy, geriatrics, nutrition, uh, all these people see the patients in the hospital routinely can take more time and they believe that that may be part of the reason why they spent an extra day in the hospital just because there was more for them to do before going home. They did see a lower 90 day readmission rate with the ERAS protocol and they attributed this to possibly better communication after discharge and the patients also being more prepared for discharge because of their preoperative interventions. They found less inpatient opioid use with ERAS and no difference in VAS or ambulation um, with physical therapy indicating that they did not have worse pain control despite the fact they used less opioids. And they found statistically significant decreases in urinary retention and constipation, which may be related to opioid use as we all know those uh, medications do cause uh, retention and constipation post-op that we have to manage. So the limitations of this study it is a relatively small population size. There's no data on post-opioid, post-discharge opioid use. So we don't know if they were using the same or more narcotics or less narcotics once they left the hospital. 
Um, there was also that trend towards an extra fusion level in the pre-ERS group, so that may have an effect on the um, results. And uh, this is also a very specific um, population in terms of the type of patient in that it was elderly patients that were undergoing long fusions to the pelvis. So that limits the generalizability, but it's also important to um, specifically look at ERS in these patients. So the authors con concluded that a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to spine surgery reduces opioid intake, severe constipation, urinary retention requiring catheterization, and readmission rates in elderly patients undergoing degenerative scoliosis correction. And this effect is particularly important for a procedure that's inherently morbid and in patients that are especially vulnerable to the side effects of opioids. Thanks, Joe. Great overview. We've got a couple minutes for discussion and I'm going to really just open the floor because I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of our, our, our panel here would like to contribute on this. Uh, you know, adult deformity, obviously a lot of potential for cost, great opportunity for back size with the ROS protocols. Uh, please let me open up the floor because I know not a lot of people have uh, points they want to make. I have to shut up. I always have questions, but uh, one of the most controversial medications that is very popular with our anesthesiologists, and I appreciate Dr. Cutteroff, Rachel Cutteroff is on our chief of spine anesthesia, is ketamine. So uh, I have had horrible problems with many of my patients having PTSD. I'm not sure how it is, for instance, at UCSF with that medication, and I didn't see that specifically uh, called out in that EROS paper on post-operative pain management. So ketamine. Well, that, that's a great point, uh, and maybe I'll address that if that's all right, Joe, because we've had a lot of experience with that uh, here at UCSF on our pain management service. We found specifically that the subset of patients who are managed by pain management are more likely to get ketamine and have a prolonged length of stay. So I agree, ketamine's been a, been a very difficult one for us. Uh, in the past, it required people to be in, in the ICU. We're now able to give it on the floor. But uh, I, I think with regard to the effect of uh, ketamine, uh, the subset of patients who are on ketamine tend to stay longer. Now, having said that, that's also a subset of patients who have more difficult with pain control, so it's a bit self-fulfilling, and um, uh, it's one that I'd prefer to avoid. What are you doing about ketamine now? Well, it's unstructured. It's uh, uh, provider preferential, uh, but again, we don't like it as surgeons, and uh, this is in contradistinction to anesthesia colleagues. Second quick topic, I know it's rapid fire. There are two medications that have worked very well. Uh, a liposomal bound uh, marking and uh, IV Tylenol. Those are no longer available in our formulary for us because they're, quote, too expensive. Is this uh, being penny wise and pound foolish, and are you allowed to use that at UCSF? Yeah, so our orthoplasty service did have some experience with liposomal bound marking, and uh, they, they've stopped using it, I believe, because of expense without the demonstration of an effect size. We really hadn't adopted that much in our spine procedures. I think the effect size may be more for degenerative pathology, people going home the same day than for deformity, but we, we hadn't adopted that. With regard to IV Tylenol, uh, that, that's not in our protocol right now. Oral Tylenol is, but the IV Tylenol is not. Have, have you noticed an effect size between IV and oral Tylenol? Uh, yes, so when I came, uh, when I switched sides from academics to private uh, we had both of those available, and it was amazing. For the outpatient spine surgeries, the phone calls would not come after 24 hours. They'd come after 72 hours when you had the liposomal bound marking. The IV Tylenol is the same thing. It is way more potent than the oral Tylenol, especially in these post-operative patients who have a hard time absorbing, who may have an ileus or not. So um, it is prohibitively expensive without a doubt. But again, one single day hospital stay uh, saved uh, more than pays for it. And again, there's just a paucity of studies. In fact, no studies that have demonstrated that. Thank you. Again, I can comment engaged. on. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, at uh, at TBI, I can comment on that as well because we had similar yet different experiences. Um, we did a pilot study with the uh, liposomal uh, anesthetic, and albeit it was an earlier formulation, and we found that our post-operative narcotic rate actually went up rather than down. Between that and the cost, we stopped using it. The same thing with uh, IV Tylenol. We started using IV Tylenol in our ERAS program. Some data came out that the PO was just as effective. Again, cost issue, and we've switched, we've switched to PO on you know, all our one and two level fusions and artificial disc patients, and really didn't see clinically a difference between the PO and, and the IV. Now, we're not doing bigger cases like you are, but for the smaller cases, uh, that's the way it's turned out for us. 
So I just want to thank you guys again for doing this. And, I, you know, I th to me, I think the common thread there is patient education, patient involvement, and patient expectations. I think um, that's what we've learned a lot through the course of our careers. Who would have ever thought you could do an ACL uh, reconstruction as an outpatient when they first started? And people were in the hospital for a week getting, uh, you know, uh, CPM on their knees. So um, we've all come a long way, but it's, it's the expectations to the patients that all of these programs have. And the, 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 de the devil's in the details details, how do you translate what works in a big tertiary academic institution into every community hospital in the U.S.? But the, the benefits are clearly demonstrated. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for, for highlighting that. And, and as a final comment, Jack, I think that as we demonstrate effect sizes for some of these interventions and EROS protocols, where this will become incentivized by the hospital is we, if we really save costs, because under a shared risk program, under a bundle payment, that's where uh, there's really the highest incentive for, for hospitals and healthcare systems to really em embrace these protocols. So thanks again for allowing us to share this relevant topic. Great. All right, thanks, Higgs, and the rest of the fellas. Have bye. a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.